This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network, now in its seventh year. Talk like you've never heard it before. Hey everybody, it's Alex, it's the Ramble, and we're here until midnight tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, he's Larry, and he's Bubbles, and he's brown brown. as ever. Brown as ever. (laughs) Not to be confused with a band called uh, Bubbles Brown, or Brown Bubbles. Oh, brown bubbles? Let me be yeah, brown, brown comma bubbles. Yeah. Or bubbles. I'm, yeah. Well, they're in Chicago, I think. But. Yeah. We're, we've gone into it before and how that name came to be Paula Poundstone. Yeah. She thought you were, you were about as exciting as you are right now, and so she called you bubbles. No, we're, no we're, I was trying to get her to go to a hot tub, and that's why. Oh, I see. And, th- and there are bubbles in the hot tub. Yes, of course. What, why were you trying to get her to go to a hot tub? Were you trying to... It, uh, well, it was her and another woman at the Holy City Zoo. At, th- at the time, it seemed like a good idea. <laughs> you figured maybe you'd get a little <laughs> yeah. if you went to the hot tub? Yes, because the week before, I'd uh, actually gone to that hot tub with two women that weren't comics, and... Uh, then I got it. I, actually, I got in there. With, I walked in with two women, and people thought I was a god, and uh, <laughs> nothing happened. <laughs> what I remember, the, it seemed like, it seemed like yeah. such a great idea going in. Then when we actually started going in, I think I got terrified. <laughs> yeah, you got terrified. Yeah. Oh, what am I going to do with two women? <laughs> well, you disappoint both of them, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Like the dog that chases the car. If he ever catches it, what's he going to do? You know? have, you, have you ever done a twosome? No, I always wanted to, but that was very elusive. I did a twosome. Oh, once I wow. did it. I did a couple of twosomes. I mean, twosomes. a threesome. A threesome. A threesome. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I do a twosome. It's me and me. Uh, but uh, I, did a, I did a threesome. I've done a couple of threesomes in my life, but the threesome that was the most memorable was two sisters. Ooh. Yeah, I know. Strange. I mean, they weren't, like, kissing each other or doing anything like that, but they were both having sex with me. But I never liked threesomes. Because for the well, someone that told me that had been involved in them said that it actually sounds better than it is because you're trying to give attention to both of them, and it's kind of awkward, and... Well, the worst part is if one of them is your current girlfriend, okay, and now you have this third person in bed with all of you, and you want to try and pay as much attention to her as you do to the other person, yeah. you're spending too much time being diplomatic, okay? So it really is not a good thing. It, uh, being diplomatic when you're having sex is... Not fun because you're you're having to you, you can't get into the spirit of the moment. You're parceling yourself out. I mean, I maybe better to be a threesome with another guy than at least you <laughs> can like all grab for the woman, you know. But, uh, but you never say so you never had the threesome you wanted. No, to have. no, that was that, that's on the bucket list. Well, that was the Mount Everest of uh, of sex, you know. Was to, oh, hey, what happened? I had a threesome last night. Oh, yeah, that'd what be was wild. it like? Oh, that's got to be wild. No, I couldn't get it up. You know, I mean, <laughs> you, you disappointed two women. Well, in those situations, you know, like uh, my uh, my my personally, I never had a problem um, with my body. Uh, uh, n- not reacting to sex, but uh, you know who knows, you know. Um, but that that's uh, you know it, it's uh, 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 what was I going to say? Oh well, see, I forgot what I was going to say here. Um, but uh, it, it, you know, I I just uh, think uh, uh, God, I've, I've completely bl- my mind's blown here. See? Well, you're tired. That's from you're being tired. tired. Okay. So anyway, so I just the threesome is not a uh, not a wonderful idea. 
Uh, okay. Yeah. If I don't make it, it's no big deal then. Yeah. My equipment here is kind of screwing up on me a little bit, so I hope this is all recording okay. Uh, I've got a, a problem with the... Uh, oh, boy. What is this? Okay, now are we are we through? Okay, we're through. All right, I think we're still. Are we still recording? Yeah, we're still recording. I I was having some problem here with the equipment. That's what I was talking about. Problems with the equipment. Problems with the equipment. Yeah. Pro- problems with the equipment. Yeah. Is sometimes if you got into a situation like that, all of a sudden this one thing, which has always been your like your divining rod, okay, it it stops working. And you go, why? And the answer is, you're probably too scared or frightened of the situation or the anticipation is so high. There was this woman I knew who was hot, really hot. She was she was a friend, I, maybe my oldest friend in the world because when I was a kid, she was a younger kid than me and was the daughter of somebody my mother worked for. So I got to know her as a, just a friend, all right? And she grew up, and she grew up into this. I mean, if you saw her, your jaw would drop, okay? And I always kept thinking about having sex with her, but when I finally met up with her again in New York, she was married. So that was impossible, but I could be friends with, with she and her husband. All of a sudden, one day, they break up. And I've just broken up with my wife. And I go, I've always wanted to do this, okay? And we got into the situation. And I couldn't get it up. <laughs> I just couldn't. And I, you know, I made the excuse most guys do. That's never happened to me before. And she's kind of <laughs> looking at me like, sure, it's never happened to you before. Probably happens every time. But she, but she gave me the answer. Oh, it's okay. I said, okay, let's do another play date on this thing. And we did it, and I was fine, and I, you know, performed. You redeemed yourself. Yeah. But I was so, I think, so amped up. I For years, I had wanted to have sex with this woman. For years. And finally, the day came, and, and you just, it, bleep, that's it. <laughs> You know, and you're looking down at it going, hey, you know, I've been a friend to you. Why are you doing this to me <laughs> Why now? Why are you betraying me? <laughs> you know, many times I, I haven't wanted to jerk off, but I did it because I knew it would make you feel good. <laughs> yeah, so. I just never could figure that one out. Well, a beautiful woman could be intimidating. Mm. Very much so, especially someone you've lusted after for, you know, many, 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 many years. I mean, I'd known her since I was a, since I was a kid, since I was like eight years old, nine years old, something like that. No, fifteen, something like that. But anyway, if I said, who, if somebody said to me, "Who's the person you've known the longest?" I would have to say this woman. Okay. So anyway, you know, uh, did, did, have you ever had that happen to you, Larry? See, I assume uh, I assume mm. you have sex. <laughs> okay, I'm assuming you have sex. I not for a while, but uh, back in the day, um, you were doing yeah, it a there, lot. You were doing it a lot. I did okay. Yeah, yeah. that was partly because of being on radio. That 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 helped more than stand up. Oh, that helped. That helped for me too. You know, uh, I I don't know how I would get laid today if I wasn't on the radio, but I don't care anymore because I'm eighty two, almost eighty two years old, and uh, that equipment doesn't work very well now. You know, because I had all that prostate stuff with the cancer and so on. And by the time they got through puncturing my prostate with a hundred radioactive seeds, it pretty much doesn't function like it used to. You know, but uh, it was uh, it was amazing, just amazing. Yeah. Well, didn't you find during radio? So your vo- your voice is hitting hundreds of thousands of people, and some women actually fall in love with a voice. Uh, yes, I think so. But I've never had any woman who seemed to have fallen in love with my voice. Um, I'd like to think they fell in love with me. Or if not me, a certain appendage. You know, otherwise, <laughs> I, you know. 
you never had to play Misty for me. Stop. No, I never had anybody say to me, you know, boy, I love your voice. Oh, I love listening to your voice on radio. I've never heard, I've never had that. Really? And I, I don't got know. that a few times. Huh? I got that a few times. I don't even like my voice. Well, I would think that women would have been attracted to you because there's almost, there's a motherly instinct in women, and you are the person who just screams out for motherly love. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know. Most of the women I met through comedy were more depressed than me. <laughs> Seriously. And it was, uh, someone told me, oh, they were attracted to your act because you were like them. But uh, they were so depressed that it was depressing for me to be around them. It was just horrible. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. I, was just, I like someone that's kind of, when you're, you like the opposite, so someone that's kind of positive and upbeat would be much preferable to someone that's suicidal. But what kind of women were then, attra- on the whole, what kind of women were attracted to you because of your persona? They were depressed. They are very depressed. So oh, oh, really? I don't, I don't know why they would be attracted. They weren't, they should have been attracted to the opposite, but they weren't, so. Yeah, I don't know. I I can't say there was any type of woman that was attracted to me. You know, um, they just happened. And if anybody was like, "Oh, oh, uh, hey, Alex, tell me all about the radio show," and you know, they and they're like really into uh, the groupy kind of thing, I would have nothing to do with them. Yeah. I didn't want anybody who didn't want me because they found me attractive on a visceral level. Does that make sense? Yes, but women are attracted to success, which is, there's a theory that men, everything men do to try to become successful is because of sex. Trying yeah. to impress women. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, and you were very successful, so naturally you got a lot of women. I don't know that, God, I, you know, I, it's, it's funny you mention that. Yes, if I look back on it, I will have to say, yes, I was successful. But at the time, I didn't think I was successful. I never had that feeling. You know, when I look back now and I see what I'm making now as opposed to what I was making then, yes, I was successful. <laughs> uh, but uh, I never thought... No, you were a household name. But I never thought of that. You know, I never... Th- I, uh, and, I, and I certainly was aware of it. I mean, I would go into a restaurant and because I'd been on TV and stuff, people knew what I looked like, uh, they would stare at me. Uh, and I would notice that. But I didn't, it didn't, it didn't uh, 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 become a feeling in my mind that I was famous. You know what I'm saying? It's very strange. Uh, I knew that I was, but I didn't know that I was. Am I making any kind of sense Yeah, here? yeah. You but know. did you did you enjoy the recognition? Well, you enjoy it, yes. At the time, I suppose. What you don't enjoy is when you no longer are getting the recognition. You know, uh, when all of a sudden uh, it, nobody knows who the hell you are. Right. That's, yeah. Which which is why people in show business rarely quit. It is addiction. It is an addiction. I mean, some people quit because they never get successful at it. They suddenly realize one day, well, I better go into real estate. You know? Um, I mean, how many comedians do you know who have failed didn't go, didn't suddenly go into some other business? You know, they quit radio and they went and did whatever they did. You know? Uh, well, you know who, uh, when it, it's funny you bring that out of real estate. Do you know who went into real estate? Uh, I just saw on Facebook is Robert Morton. Robert, oh, Bob Morton? I mean, uh, yeah. Morty. Uh, yeah. Uh, Letterman's uh, uh, producer. He had a picture on Facebook of him uh, uh, on stage with Letterman. He said, I've gone into a new business, and he's totally into real estate. Wow. Sells real, you do, know. do you know uh, You know where I first met Morty? Uh, he told me something to, this, this something to do about cable. He was coming door-to-door selling cable service. And wow. uh, I didn't, I didn't realize it was Bob Morton. He told me the story years later. He says, "You know where the where we first met up 
And he said, I want to thank you because you, you made me a lot of money. And I said, how was that? He said, in fact, it was the most money I ever made before I worked for a letterman. I said, he said, I was selling the cable door to door and we were using Midnight Blue, the show you produced, to kind of sell it. And really? he, he was going door to door with, are you ready, Stu Smiley. You know the name Stu Smiley? I know Stu Smiley, yeah. Yeah, Stu Smiley also was somebody who worked in the comedy business and was, a, I think, a head of comedy at Showtime. He did, yeah. Yeah. So these two very famous business people who were big guys in the, in the producing business and in the cable business and so on uh, were the first. The, I was one of the doors they knocked on. <laughs> wow! Yeah, they said they said Midnight Blue and Chinese programming on cable was what made them the most money. <laughs> well, Morty was always cool with me. Uh, yeah, Morty was Morty's a great guy. Everybody loves Morty. I did his first uh, show as producer of Letterman. Yeah, he got uh, well, he got he, bumped up from segment producer to producer. He produced it while he was at NBC, and then he went over to CBS with uh, with Letterman. And then at some point, and I'd have to ask Shecky why this happened. All of a sudden, Morty was no longer there. They had a falling out. I think I don't know what it was over. Yeah, but he had a lot of he had. I guess he was maybe 15 years, something like that, with, with Letterman, maybe more. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Easily, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, mean, I, I I have no idea what happened there. I, in fact, uh, next time I talk to Shecky, I'm, oh, cu- I'm, cu- I'm curious. I have to know. Shecky uh, knows where all the bodies are buried. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's been. He should write a book. Well, he gets interviewed a lot for books. You know, and he he kind of he kind of worries that he might say something wrong, you know, or some story out of school, uh, tale out of school. Yeah, there is that because uh, show business is like high school. Everybody gets upset over nothing. You know? Yeah, but he, you know, it's a matter of being able to say uh, uh, this or that and feel that you're telling nothing that's horrible. But you just don't know how Dave's going to react to it or whatever. Although you don't work for Dave anymore, so you shouldn't care. You know? <laughs> yeah, true. But there, it's funny. The, a lot of the people who work for Dave still have a very protective feeling about him because he was very good to his staff, and they they in fact he went several years longer than he wanted to with the Late Show because he didn't want to put his people out of work. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he always didn't had. Uh, they always uh, didn't had, he pay his writers during the strike? Yes. There was a writer's strike, and he kept paying them. That's great. Uh, and uh, he was the first to settle with the because he was an independent production company. He was the first to settle with the union, saying, "Fine, you know, I don't care what you want to give them. They're they're worth it to me, you know." So, I mean, he, it, uh, everything I ever got from Shecky was that there was a very dark side to Dave. Okay? You couldn't really get close to him, you know? Uh, and he had a lot of... He, he, he never felt he ever did a good show, and he was, you know, he, he was a difficult person. But on the other hand, they all liked him because mm-hmm. he treated them all with respect and he treated them well. And that's all that really matters in the end. I understand why he was probably difficult because as a performer myself, where I was doing a show in San Francisco and I had a whole crew, you were one of them. Uh, I was responsible for all of your incomes. I know. If I yeah. failed, then every one of us walked out the door. You know, so uh, I know that pressure. And uh, if Dave wasn't the sweetest guy in the world or the, the least difficult guy in the world to get along with or to deal with, I understand it, you know. But uh, he, in the end, he was a very good guy to his staff, uh, cared about them, you know, and always made sure they were, they were taken care of, even down to the interns, you know. I mean, he, would, he, he was very good about that. So Yeah. How can you hate a guy like that, right? 
And uh, nobody, I don't think anybody will ever host a show for more than 30 years in TV. That'll never be seen again. I, I don't think that'll ever be seen again, and with good reason, because uh, most people don't have the temperament for it, you know? Uh, I mean, uh, there are a couple of people now who can do what Letterman does. I think Jimmy Kimmel comes the closest. Uh, he seems to really... He seems to be a broadcaster. You know, Dave was a broadcaster. That's what Dave was. And uh, Fallon isn't a broadcaster. And Colbert isn't a broadcaster. Uh, these are people... Colbert came through Broadway theater. He did a Sondheim show. I think it was in Company, the original Broadway version of Company. Uh, and, and these people who aren't broadcasters don't really know how to do it. You know, Letterman knew how to do it. Knew how to put on a television show you know so. that's why remember we both thought pat sajak was going to be good at a talk show because he had a broadcasting background but it kind of fizzled well i had had pat sajak and vanna white in my studio in san francisco and with pat i suddenly found this guy who was snarky and he was sharp and he was funny and he was yeah. his humor was uh, edgy okay uh, and I guess he did that because doing Wheel of Fortune every day, you have to be Mr. Good Guy, spin the wheel, you know. Uh, <laughs> so when I heard that he had gotten a sh the late show on CBS, which people may remember, Pat Sajak had a show late nights before Letterman ever took it. 89. Uh, uh, 89 on CBS. At, you remember the year? Wow, good for you. Anyway, it's terrific. Just terrific. Um and uh, I've said, "Wow, he's going to be a big star. He's going to he's going to be incredible." All right. Um, so I, you know, I I went good for him. You know, uh, I can hardly wait till he goes on. And then he went on, and he like played it safe all the way around. And I said, "Be the guy I saw in my yeah. studio, and you're going to be a hit." And he just played it safe, and he was off in I think thirteen weeks or something. Yeah, like that. too bland. Yeah, exactly. So, you know. You know what happens to me? Every time my phone rings in the house, uh, my, my, my watch vibrates. And I have to keep doing an interview while my, my, uh, my wrist is vibrating. Anyway. Um, well, it takes a pro to get through that. Yeah, but I mean, I'd say Jack could have had it made if he'd just been edgy. If he'd just been the guy that I knew and I saw, you know, and used that ability. He reminded me a lot of Jack Parker. He had that quality. And I felt he could have been he could have been big. And so when that came on, I went, this is going to give Carson some real run for his money if he does it right. And he didn't do it right. Yeah. You know, it was back to Wheel of Fortune. Uh, yeah. I think, I'm wondering, did he keep doing Wheel of Fortune during that time? That's what I'm trying to remember. Because, you know, they go and they shoot five of those shows a day. They do a whole season in about a month, and then you're off. That's why a lot of people do game shows. It's, yeah, that's pretty uh, quick money. It's it's very quick money. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, a lot of people, you know, you go, why did Drew Carey decide to do a game show? The Price is Right. Because there's a lot of money in it, and you don't have to work that much. You know, you get a, it's a month out of your life, and then you're you're good to go, you know, and you've you've made money for a whole season, so there isn't a better job than that. I'll tell you right now. Uh, although it would drive me crazy every day, say, saying the same things over and over and over again. Well, it's time for the final thing here. Spin the wheel. Uh, okay, uh, how much money? You know, <laughs> and having to do that same thing every that would, that would single be a nightmare. Yeah. Wheel of Fortune, you got to get dizzy after a while watching that wheel going around. Anyway, but Pat Sajak uh, could have had it made, and he, he blew it. I think it. so, yeah. He, he, was, he, was, he was funny, I remember that. He blew it. But you know what that's like. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, I'm telling you right now, if you really, really pushed it, you could have been one of the biggest comedians around. Oh, I, yeah. Well, yeah. So anyway. Hey, well, I'm going to come back when I'm uh, 95. When you're 95? 
Yeah. You know something? It, this whole place is going crazy. I'm doing the show. I must have gotten four phone calls while we were on. Okay, and the doorbell has rang two times. <laughs> And in a whole day, I could, I could, I could shoot myself here, and they wouldn't find the body till it started to rot. Okay. <laughs> oh boy. Anyway, uh, listen, Larry. Let's do this yeah. again in a couple of weeks. Okay, or yeah, next week. Cool, right? This will be next. Be next week for the rest of you folks, but for and I, it's a couple of weeks. And it's Larry Bubbles Brown. Are you playing anywhere we should know about Larry? I'm a well. Uh, let's see. I uh, no, not not this. Okay, one. the not working. Larry Bowles Brown. Thank working, you very yeah. much, Larry. God, glad I could plug that. <laughs> Bye. Bye. This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Now in its seventh year, talk like you've never heard it before. Ah, yes. Okay, there we go. Like you've never heard it before. Okay, all right. Anyway, uh, I'm a little out of sync right now, right? Am I? Yeah, I am. I'm not out of sync, by the way. If I go over to uh, the Zoom panel, I'm not as out of sync over there as I am here. See, look, watch this. See, I'm not, uh, see? see how I am? I'm fine. I'm cool. Uh, anyway, uh, let me get rid of that. Uh, two people are waiting in our room tonight. Boy, it's getting slow lately. It's getting really slow. It's people kind of saying to me, Alex, you know, you're you're washed up. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, God. And then, I, you know, I tell you, I got, I, I, I get, go crazy with myself. Uh, I've had this problem for the last couple of day, weeks where uh, it kind of, burns when I go to pee okay and um, then today I had an urgency to pee really badly and I ran into the bathroom before I got there I peed a little bit in my pants now I've never done that in my life I don't think I did that when I was a kid okay anyway so um uh, I, I got really worried about it. I looked it up, all right? And, of course, what does it say? It says, well, you, know, you could have this, you could have that, cancer. And they have cancer, and you have a link to cancer, you know? So now I figure I've got cancer, all right? Uh, and I don't, I don't know what that's all about. Uh, so I start looking it up, uh, but bladder cancer. Well, all the things, some of the things that have been happening to me, it lists there like the hurting to pee and urgency to pee. Boom. But it says this could also be other things. And so I look up, uh, let me see here, what was it? Uh, um, oh, what was the other thing I looked up? And, and there, UTI, urinary tract infection. So I looked that up, and it's the same exact symptoms, except it is in cancer. So now, of course, in my mind, what I'm doing is I'm saying it's cancer, all right? It's cancer, and it's not good cancer, it's the bad cancer, okay? And so now I've got cancer. That's my latest, my latest thing, uh, because I always think the worst. So I'm gonna make an appointment to see my urologist on Monday and go see him and have him take a look at it. It's probably cancer, you know. Uh, probably the radiation that I got for the prostate uh, became uh, cancerous elsewhere, and I've only got a few months to live. Oh, and I have blood in my urine. <laughs> you, you don't want to know any of this, do you? I have blood in my urine, but nothing you can see. I, I, you wouldn't know it was there. It, my urine is clear, right? Only They only know at my doctor's office when they dip that thing in there, and it says, ooh, there's a little bit of, there's a trace of blood in here. And I've had a trace of blood in my urine, I swear to you, to my knowledge, for the last 20 years. I don't know what it is. They've never been able to figure it out. Some doctors have put me through very arduous uh, uh, things like, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, oh, the, uh, uh, where they stick the thing up your, uh, forget it. Well, anyway. I, I've gone through all of that, and I have to explain to every doctor. And finally, I went to a urologist, and I said, 
Now you're going to check to see if I have blood in my urine and you'll probably find it there, but I've always had it there. I've had it there for at least the last 20 years. He goes, eh, that's nothing. Okay, so that's the guy I'm going back to. Anyway, uh, it's probably, you know, it, it's probably cancer. Okay, all right, that's urinary. It's a bladder cancer of the worst kind. You know, it's, I always think of the worst possible. We did this with, with uh, uh, what's his name last night, with uh, Tony last night, because he thinks he might have prostate cancer. Well, you know, you always, I always think the worst because then I can control the situation. Because when the worst does happen, I'll be okay. Does that make sense? Okay. I don't know if it does or it doesn't. Anyway, uh, we don't have many people here, but they're uh, two good people. Uh, and they are uh, Josh Wheeler and Alan's here as well. Wait a minute. Here comes Josh. There we go. There they are. Hello, guys. How are you? Sounds like a urinary tract infection. Does it really? Yep. Not, you get them. Not, 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 you don't even have to do anything and you get them. So, I've, had, I've had this for weeks, though, but it hasn't gotten worse. Okay. You know, I, oh. uh, but you, but those symptoms I just said is the symptoms you've had with urinary tract infections. Yeah, well, I have them because I have chronic prostatitis, and so my prostate hurts, and it doesn't lead to cancer, supposedly, and then... It turns into an infection, and they give me Cipro for seven days, and everything's better. Really? Yeah. Well, well, I took. Some How come you don't get those dipsticks yourself? You can get them. I'll, I'll send you some. Oh, good, great. Then you Marjorie will a, Mar Mar Marjorie and dip it in, and you compare it to the side, and you'll know if you have an infection. Or Marjorie not. will thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, she won't. You know, but anyway, you can use them for Marjorie. Can you? Women tend to get. Well, I had some. I had some. Old, I had some old Cipro in the house, and I took it to see if it would go away, and it got a little better. But it was old Cipro. It was like ten years old. Doesn't it probably doesn't. I don't think it goes. I mean, it, it, it gets weaker and weaker. Yeah. As, yeah. As it expires, but it doesn't turn toxic. It doesn't turn. If it toxic. got better. I would ask the urologist well, to prescribe. It was you. A, a little better. A little better. You know, by measures. But uh, anyway, he'll he'll uh, he'll he'll know what. All what. right. Yeah, it sounds like you got a good urologist. They ne they never check you for bladder cancer or anything like that. Uh, that that's the cystoscopy that they did on me that was like, ouch. You know, we discussed that last night. Yeah. That, yeah. That's no fun. Well, I've done two of them. Oh wait a minute, I forget to do this every night. Look at that. No. You see. look okay either way. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, you look okay. Uh, anyway. But anyway, uh, you know, I, uh, 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 I, I just hope he doesn't put me through all of that, you know. Um, but don't, I don't start sounding like Tony now. Last <laughs> night over the over well, the we're not even going to listen to Tony with his prostate tonight. I'm listening to yours and to be shown like I'm just like you, Alex. Huh? My pee is clean. My pee is. I do. I told that to Shecky. You know why I get along with you? Like I, I like to listen to you. You sound like me. I, when I pee, I just, I don't see any blood. That was before, you know what I was doing? I was drinking so much water today. It was like a camel, right? Yeah. And I'm looking. There's no blood. <laughs> I, was, I, was doing, I Google everything and read. I said, okay. Well, Alex has blood that you can't see in your urine. Really? Yeah. He was saying that earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think I have prostate. Was yours, like, could you see your blood in the urine? Who, me? Alan. Oh, oh uh, no. 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 Nope. It, it, nope. Sure didn't. So I they, mean, I did, they I did, did one time, long time ago, and they do prostatitis. They, yeah, they do the cystoscopy, and then they look up there, and they find nothing. Oh. And you've gone through all that trouble for nothing. Let's pray. That's right. Let's pray that Tony gets one of those. They, you know, your 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 urethra is about the size of a pencil. Oh, I, well, I, I, have a, I have a I have a urologist. And I have a, um, um, a, a, a stomach guy. Oh, you do? You have problems with your stomach guy? Well, you, you know. Gastroenterologist. A gastroenterologist. Oh. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and then I don't have, however, I don't have the guy that goes down the throat. Who, what is oh, endoscopy? Uh, endoscopy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what I want to do is I want to get all three doctors together at the same time. May as well have them a fee, have a field day. 
being Ask paid off. I'm a, I am like a nervous wreck like you. I get all mad at this. I want an endoscopy, <laughs> a cystoscopy, I want to be and a, uh, uh, what do you call it? A colonoscopy. All at God. the same time, and I want to see if they can see each other. They can all bill each other at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, only, it's only really two doctors, Alex. The, the GI doctor does the colonoscopy and the endoscopy. Oh, really? He never offered to do an endoscopy. 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 Forget it. Endoscopy. Yeah, whatever. We know what you mean. I was calling the urologist the neurologist. I was going to go to the urologist. <laughs> My brother's well, like, it's well, a urologist. Well, I know colonoscopy <laughs> is colon, but shouldn't an endoscopy be the colon? Uh, well, it's the starting of the colon. It's your esophagus. Because it goes in your stomach. end. Yep. But one goes well, in your end, once scope. goes down oh. your throat, and one goes in your wah-wah. Yeah, yeah, but they look at your it, it, your esophagus and your We've stomach. got a lot of people listening right now. We must be turning them on with this just disgusting talk about I health. think everybody wants to, uh, you know, have Tony film when they do the cystoscopy. Yeah, you know, Tony. Me. Tony, you want to go to Alex's urologist? Yeah, <laughs> I'll put you on speaker, Alex. Hold on, if you answer. Well, the nice thing <laughs> about the nice thing about the prostate <laughs> exam, right, is that when mm, he's through, when he's through, he gives you flowers. It's very, it's very oh. nice. Yeah, <laughs> I want chocolate. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, hello, Josh. How are you? I'm sorry, Josh, about my problems. Good. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine. What's I'm sure, What's yeah. up, Doc? Well, also, lucky he's still young. Hmm? Doesn't have to go through all these problems. Well, the yeah. thing is, though, if you get any of these things when you're younger, oops, excuse me, I, I forget it, forget it. I don't want Tony to get no. all bothered. You know? Yeah, because I get nervous, really. Yeah, I couldn't well, sleep. Got I got couldn't sleep I was thinking of all that. I was like, oh, my God. Turns to us and turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The dogs knew it. They were looking at me like I was crazy. <laughs> so what's new, Josh? What do you think about the Supreme Court today? With their whole thing with the uh, with the abortion Texas. thing in uh, in Texas, uh, you know I don't really know what happened today. It was a pretty pretty dang busy day when I came home and turned the news on, and uh, um, you know I I have like unfollowed on my Twitter feed so many news organizations because they just put the same stuff out. Yeah, yeah. Over and over and over again, you know, like they keep retweeting their same tweets and all that. So, I mean, I'm, you know, was pretty disconnected today. So I think I sort of glean from some of the people that I still have on there that most have been happy with something about that. I don't know what it was up for. I, I, what they do, do they just uh, refuse to... Or well, here's what no, here's what they like said. That, like uh, put a stay in effect or something. They they won't put a stay in effect, but they're taking the case. They're taking the uh, the protest okay, against. Okay, so they just so. wouldn't put a stay in effect. You know, which is a little odd. Um, I find that a little odd. You know, I don't John, think that's uh, John Roberts talked to yeah. the other liberal or the liberal people and said uh, that Texas is trying to go around us uh, by doing mm -hmm. this, which is pretty obvious mm -hmm. and we need to step in and do something about it so john roberts what voted uh, uh, for staying and uh, for not staying or for staying it uh yeah for for stopping okay. the texas thing so what you got was four to four to five right yeah i guess so yeah yeah i don't know i didn't see i mean i'll, I'll try to look it up here in a minute but uh i i do think the lack of a stay seems a little odd um you know, because a stay is usually aired on the side of caution. You know, it, it doesn't particularly hurt much. Uh, and a stay typically doesn't have any sort of imminent threat to people's liberty or safety or things like that. So they're, you know, they're generally granted for these you know, large cases, uh, high, high profile stuff. Um, so I'm not really sure why, you know, one wasn't granted with, unless you sat down and took a look at Did, didn't they have the one opinions. a couple of weeks ago, Josh, didn't they have one a couple of weeks ago? And then some concern, I think, judge. I think the one in Mississippi, right. They didn't, they didn't issue a stay on it. Either, oh, I, don't I don't know. So I, I guess in that, in that light, you know, today's lack of a stay is probably, uh, 
not that surprising, um, which might make some sense because I read a, a retweet of something that uh, maybe Justice Sotomayor wrote mm-hmm. and, and her opinion that someone had put out. And I figured this is what it was about. Like I said, I was pretty disconnected, but, you know, it just said like the court, you know, refused to take this step a few weeks ago and has done so again. You know, I still disagree, blah, 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 or whatever. But, uh, you know, I'm not really sure what what some of their um, justification for a lack of a stay was. I mean, that's what I'm saying is it's not uncommon to have one granted in times of, you know, you saw some of that with like the, the border issues and things under even under Trump and, you know, also under Biden, where federal judges will usually say, okay, we're not going to decide this issue now, but we agree that it is a pertinent constitutional question that needs to be decided. So what we're going to do in the meantime is we're just going to revert back to what was the status quo. Mm -hmm. We're going to stay with that for a while because that's how we've been operating for a pretty long time. You know, so everything was... We're not saying it was working. We're just saying that's what it was. That was the law. This is the new law, but it is obviously questionable. Until the courts look at it, we're going to revert back to what we had. So why they wouldn't do that? Now, by the way, you made a you made a verbal error that I always have to correct people on. Revert back. You don't revert back. Well, that is a technically yeah, like a, it's a uh, double. double. Uh, it, it's a it, it, double entendre. It, no, no, it's it's a double. I'm trying to remember what it's called exactly, but what it is is, if you say revert, you mean you're going back. So you don't say revert yes. back. Correct. It's like saying I'm going back back. Yes. Yeah. So I write so much work of history. Yeah. And they are so picky in that field about every single word that you use that speaking with incredibly incorrect English is my way of telling the historical community they can go fuck them. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, it, I know, I've probably talked to you about it before, but it's just like you can't wrote that uh, Cornwallis felt that by moving his army to North Carolina, no, he didn't feel He couldn't feel it. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Right. You know, I mean, it's just you had to be very clear about, everything. you know, you, you can't you can't feel that you had to have thought that. And then at the end of that sentence, there's better be a footnote proven why you think that you say that he thought that, you know, he had to have written that in a letter or spoken, uh, whatever. But I mean, it's, you know, why use well, I don't you know, know why fa- use nine words when you could use 200. I'll tell you what it is. My father was always a stickler about this sort of stuff. And he, he brought up that particular situation over and over again. No, you can't revert back. He, it drove him crazy. So I learned to get crazy whenever I hear it and have to correct it. So excuse me, please. Yes, that's true. It's just my, yes. just my father, you know. I, lo- <laughs> I love my father. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know, though, why, you know, no stay was granted. Um I'll try to read an article or two here and there a little bit. I think because you got a, you got five other assholes on the Supreme mm-hmm. Court, or four, uh, excuse me, of uh, 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 yeah, five other assholes on the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean they seem to have a real hard on for this deal here. So you know, uh, I don't know when they're going to hear the case or anything. Are, uh, are, they, are they probably the current term? I, I haven't heard SCOTUS talk about uh, Mississippi. It may, it's mainly the the Texas law. Have you heard a lot about Mississippi, uh, Josh? Oh uh, well, they're going to hear a case from Mississippi, and they they didn't they didn't uh, they did not issue a stay in that case either a couple weeks no. ago, and and they heard arguments for that. I don't understand that. why they don't issue a stay just for um, the reason. Well, I mean, there. they're they're just you know, I, I'm not really sure either. I mean, you often do get them. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know what the statistics bear out or anything but I, I mean it just seems like off the top of my head sort of knowledge that you get a lot of these sort of you know stays um usually i guess fairly easily i mean everyone always goes and argues their case but you get them a lot just because they they tend to take a cautionary uh path but they don't really seem to be yeah what seem to be doing it here well, I mean, uh, uh, okay, well, we got another situation with the Supreme Court where <laughs> Donald Trump is prevailing on the Supreme Court to prevent him for him not having to give over papers 
to Congress mm -hmm. regarding yeah. the sixth. Uh, what do you yeah. think they're going to do there? Do you think they're just going to say thank you for giving us this job and go along with him? Or uh, what? You know, I don't, I don't, I don't really, I don't know, of course, but I, I don't really think so. I mean, he doesn't have a lot going for him uh, historically. You know, I mean, Nixon obviously is the closest um, large case, I think, that you would compare it to. And there were a few of those, of course. And Nixon, you know, didn't fare very well at all, right? Right. And so some of the uh, some of the historical precedent you have there, the judicial precedent or whatever, is not is not going to be very helpful to him. Mm -hmm. I don't see much reason to overturn, you know, what what was used there. Um, you know, and that was a lot of Nixon Nixon's argument too was you know executive privilege and and all those sorts of things, but, you know, it didn't work out very well because, you know, the court basically said, you know, executive privilege is for counsel and advice and confidence and all those sorts of things, but you're being investigated for a crime, you yeah. know, and so this is not attorney-client privilege, and uh, especially when it starts to involve the White House counsel because, you know, they don't hold that, you know, in most cases, you know, because they're not the personal attorney of the president. You know, they are the White House counsel. So I don't really see where they're going to have much. I mean, I, I think mostly his ta tactics here are just to, you know, delay, 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 right? I mean, he's the insurance company trying not to pay your bill, you know? So, I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, delay, deny, deny again, then delay more. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's just going to probably take that road, hoping that it'll either go away, die down. Obviously, if he just delays it long enough and we elect a new Congress that's run overwhelmingly by Republicans, they're just going to make it disappear, you know, uh, with whatever they have. And it'll be, you know, forgotten. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they're hoping. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but that's what their idea is. I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I'm not on their head, so I can't tell you. But I would say that's what he's trying to do is just delay it for as long as possible. I think, you know, any court case that gets delayed, the longer it goes on, that is unfavorable probably for the prosecution a lot of times. So um, that, that's what he's going to try. Well, there's also right stuff there. going on here with Trump in New York with the attorney general going after him. Right. Uh, so Yeah, and he's, he's, he's doing the same thing there, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's using tactics of, you know, delay, delay. I mean, calling. Um, you know, so but you can only stall. I don't think that was going to work out yeah. very well for him either, because I think in that case he's trying to get out of giving a deposition, I believe. But uh, that's that's pretty hard to get out of. I mean, and we've seen sitting presidents in the past have to give depositions. So let alone uh, a former president, he doesn't have much to protect him there either. But he can delay it for a very long time. Well, it says here I uh, just came through on on my uh, Alexa. That Trump uh, uh, has been denied uh, the ability to claim executive privilege. Now, who was that by? The Supreme Court or Congress? Uh, you say that just came through? Yeah. Just now? Well, it just said it here. I didn't. I wasn't so aware. So I'm not sure. I mean, I don't know if something was in front of the court for that today or another federal judge at some, you know, at a lower level. That's probably likely. Mm -hmm. I think, I think was, it was. Yeah. Let me, let me okay, see so probably here. at a lower level of, of the federal court, uh, I think at times there can be a question in front of a current president about whether or not certain documents he will wish to hold an executive privilege sort of uh, in that regard indefinitely for former presidents. But I think Joe Biden's already waived all that. So given that he waived all of it, this was probably Trump's. Uh, federal appeal of that or, you know, something along those lines. So if that was denied, then, you know, also not a good sign for him. I mean, I, I think that in all these cases that he has, he doesn't have much to go on really with any of them. And he is probably going to lose mm -hmm. all of them, regardless of where it goes. But that doesn't mean that it's going to happen anytime soon. And even if he does, it doesn't mean he's in any trouble. It just means that he's finally going to have to face, 
up to the accusation. So in other words, he's going to have to give the deposition. He's going to have to turn over paperwork. He's going to have to, you know, cooperate uh, within the bounds of his rights, you know, such as right. the right to not give a statement or something like that. That's all it would mean. But that's also going to take probably a pretty long time. I mean, nine, 10 months, 12 months, 14 months, something along the, you know, and I mean, we're going to have midterms before all that, probably, you know, so I mean it, that is his, you know, that's his deal. He is delaying the repayment on his student loans for as long as he possibly can. You know? I mean, that's, that's yeah. what he's yeah. doing here, yeah. you know? Yeah. Hoping that he dies before they come to him. I mean, you know, that's that's uh, I think his idea. I mean, it's not a bad one, I guess. I mean, you know, uh, remove the name Trump from it, and that's probably what everybody who was in deep shit would do, I guess. I mean, I, I, I suppose think, if I were 80 years old and I was in serious legal trouble, I'd try to put it off for Brian, like 10 years, too. Brian. <laughs> Josh, if he keeps going and going and going, does that impact anything that he would be able to run for 2024? Uh, negatively, I would say not. I think also the reason that he puts it off longer is so that when he runs for president in 2024, I think that he would like for it to be out there because I think that will be something that he will use to embolden his peoples. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I really I, I do. I think. I think that he sees that, I and mean, his closest circle sees that as a good issue for them. I mean, because that's that's his thing. I mean, he would rather talk about that, in my opinion, than he would about what to do about foreign policy in Israel or something along the lines, something that actually is a serious question that would force him to do some thinking and some uh, governing you know, and some debating and some exchanging of ideas. All of those things are not things that interest him mm -hmm. or, frankly, that he's any good at. <laughs> so he would do something that he is good at, which yeah. is running around saying incredibly ridiculous things about how people are out to get him. And he will play this incredibly paranoia card or whatever. And, you know, it'll be great for him. Uh, you know, I mean, it's... A lot of his moves are right out of the Nixon playbook. Um, they happen to perhaps work for him more than they did for Nixon because the country has changed enough that, you know, they're easily snookered now. <laughs> you know, well, mean, I, are you, are you, you want to put I it? I guess the, I wasn't alive. You, so, you, you want to put it the nice way? They're stupid now more than they were yeah, before. Sure. I mean, that's sort of what I was trying to say nicely yeah. is that, you know, I think more Americans at least had a little bit of, you know, uh, American integrity perhaps in the time of Nixon to where, even people who loved him got to a point where they said, wow, man, there's a lot of people that live in this country that share my ideas. We'll pick from one of them and it's time for this guy to go. And we're going to, we're going to take our loss here. You know, uh, we lost this game and we're still going to try to win the championship. Another way. I mean, you know what I'm saying? They will just, we just say, wow, you know, we we're, we don't need this. And now they just folks will not okay. folks will not do that. I think Democrats have some of that in them, too. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. they certainly will sometimes defend people that it's like, just move on. Let them. me take us that. in a slightly different direction. Brian Williams, as you know, after 28 years with NBC, uh, did his last show last night on NBC, on MSNBC. Okay. Uh, he, he decided it was time to move on. And in his final parting, he said, uh, I'll try to keep this brief. After 28 years of Peacock logos on much of what I own, it's my choice now to jump without a net into the great unknown, as I did for the first time in my 62 years, my biggest, wor uh, 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 as I do for the first time in my 62 years, the biggest worry is for my country. The truth is, I'm not a liberal or a conservative, I'm an institutionalist. 
and I believe in this place, and I love my country. I yield to no one. But the darkness on the edge of town has spread to the main roads and highways and neighborhoods. It's now at the local bar, in the bowling alley, the school board, and the grocery store. We must acknowledge, and it has to be acknowledged and answered for. Grown men and women swore an oath to our Constitution, elected by their constituents, possessing the kinds of degrees I could only dream to have, have decided to join the mob and become something they are not, while hoping <coughs> we somehow forget who they were. Uh, we've decided to burn it all down with us inside. That should scare you at, to no end as much as it scares an aging volunteer fireman. Uh, anyway, that that's basically what he said last night. Did it make a lot of sense? Yeah, to I mean, you? I'll I'll let everybody else talk about that too. But I guess I had not heard that yet. So just now hearing it, my reaction to that would be that you know I would agree. I yeah. mean, it's it's we're in a bad spot, and I look forward to the day that we can emerge from it. But I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. I think we're going to survive and be fine. I think we're in a in a we're in a valley, you know, a bad one. And a bad. I look one. yes, uh, absolutely, and I look forward to emerging from it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, mm -hmm. um, a little better off than we were before we got there. Brian, you know? what do you what do you think of what the Brian Williams said? Yeah, I mean, he, he's definitely seen everything. I mean, he's not like somebody who goes in and out of news every once in a while and, and those type of things. I mean, he sees it every night. So to get that perspective from him is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Alan, what do you think? I agree. I agree with what Josh said. Yeah. And uh, Tony? I, you know, I tell you the truth, the pandemic really, and I'm not blaming Trump, and I told this to Shecky and told it to my brother, I mean, I, I, you said it too, Alex. This pandemic has brought out the worst in people for the fact that we got more divided. Did you ever think like a year later? You, he's right. People have a license. To, I mean, even by my house, you see it. It's like I've never seen people this divisive over anything. You can't even like, and it's so out in the open now. They don't, they just, it's like the country's flipped on its head. Well, it's, how, how much? I don't, think you could, I don't even think you're going to see a change anymore. How much can we blame on the pandemic? I still think, you know, if I go back, to, I, I don't want to piss off the Trumpers, but I blame Trump. He he laughed, he mocked a disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that political hoax in those speeches, he riled up, he gave them, he gave them authority to stand up and be like, hey, you know, he mocked it. Remember, he, and I think they still don't believe it. They still didn't, they, I mean, I'm not trying to say it's all that, but I, you know, my mother's gone, right? I go to the cemetery and I said to myself, if my mother was alive, she'd be like, what? you think they would align Alex, like you said, with polio. These people were dying like flies. If they had a polio shot today, would they be fighting it if their children were dying? That's interesting. That's an interesting... Uh, I, I, You know, the thing was that polio had a different dynamic. A polio primarily, except for at least the most famous person was FDR who came down with polio. Uh, but uh, uh, most of the victims of it were kids. Were okay? kids, yeah. And parents, I, I remember the time because I grew up in that time. <laughs> parents were really fearful about their kids getting it, you know, because if it didn't kill them, it was going to leave them, you know, in an iron <laughs> lung or uh, crippled for the rest of their lives. And uh, they, that was a nightmare for parents, almost more than their kid dying or being kidnapped. You know? Who takes care of the kid when they can't walk and they're gone? What do That's, you right. Just... That's right. That's uh, um, right. What? Oh, go ahead. Go, go, go ahead, Josh. Oh, I was just going to say, I just think, you know, that maybe the Trump, the pandemic or whatever, how much did it contribute to, you know, our current status? I mean, I, I just, I definitely think that it was one more, and this one was an incredibly large one. It was just one more wedge issue when we didn't need any more. You right, know, like right. we had enough. We already had guns. We already had abortion. And we already had a few, you know, things that were already just tearing people apart. And the last thing that we needed was one more of those. 
and that's what it was. I mean, outside of the the actual effects of it, like people getting sick and people dying and economic, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it was just one more damn thing for people to be like, oh, man, you know that, that guy over there's not too bad, and uh, then someone to be like, yeah, but he... He, he he's he's for he's vaccinated. Oh, that fuck that guy, man. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, it was just yeah. one more thing for people to not like each other over, like race or religion or you know what I'm saying? I mean, it was just we didn't need that. I mean, we, we just didn't. I mean, we still don't, and that's what it was. And that I I blame Trump more than anybody for helping turn it into that. Maybe it would have turned into it on its own or whatever. Well, do you think? Do you think? I, look, I think if he had just acted like a human being, I may be, I may be trivial, I may be trivializing this, but somebody <laughs> said to me, "Gee, you know, the Beatles really came and changed everything." And I said, "If it wasn't the Beatles, it would have been somebody else." Yeah, I agree with that. That the times dictate that something needs to happen, and in yeah. the case of Trump, I think if it wasn't Trump, it'd be some other Nazi. Be some yeah. other heathen uh, uh, who America would suddenly fall behind. You know. I mean, you mentioned the Beatles, Alex, right? You know what I was thinking because I read a I read a, a little bit on Lennon and I read a lot on Buddy Holly. Think about it. Buddy Holly died so young. John Lennon said that that was like a guy he looked up to. How do you know if Buddy Holly doesn't live? He may even surpass their music. No, he, he had really already knew. he had already gone past his prime as a as you a think rock he would have had a longer career? No, or no, no. but no? I but I think the Beatles, if the Beatles hadn't come along, it would have been somebody else. Okay. Hey, Alex, here's a question I ask you: If the Stones would have came over well, before, well, the Beatles, we're, we're, we're getting we're getting off topic here. Okay. I, yeah, I didn't want to turn it into a music topic. I was using yeah. that as an example. Would you okay. agree with me on that, uh, 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 Josh? That that uh, yeah. there are certain people who just come to be because the times are ready for it, and that it wasn't him as much as it was the people who were waiting for that kind of guy. Yeah, I mean, I think that's generally pretty good. I mean, that, and, and so, you know, I don't know what would have happened without uh, Trump's presence, mm -hmm. you know, but he was present. And I think that if he had just acted differently, that this issue... Yeah. It may still have become the huge divisive wedge issue that it is, but I don't know. I sort of have my doubts. I mean, I, I just feel like, or I think, had he acted appropriately in the beginning and just came out and said, listen, this is a real disease and everything. Yeah. We're going to do everything we can for vaccinations. Look, I'm getting mine. This is what you need to do. Hey, just help me out. Do this, do that, you know. He hadn't just hadn't had that circus. Back. I agree with Josh 100. A lot of his people might have, you know, because they tend to, you know, follow the head sheep. You know, they might have. It might have been different, you know, and it might not have torn us apart, yeah. and it, you know, the the stupidity might not have come along with it. But yeah. I mean, I sort of agree with your, you know, kind of person for the times or whatever. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, I mean, right? Hitler was ripe for the being. In, you know, the mid 1930s, you know, people were suffering and their reparations and the leftover from, you know, World War One and their economy and their inflation and their problems. And then here mm -hmm. comes someone and tells them who they can blame it on. Right. And they were looking for someone to blame it on. Yeah. And it it got the ball rolling, you right. know, so the people are to blame as well for things like that. There's no doubt. Yeah, Look, wait, hold, hold on a second. There's somebody here named Terry who I've never heard of. Have you ever heard of Terry calling us? Uh, let's see. I may Terry's have to get... Terry from Idaho. Huh? Hello. Terry from Idaho. Oh, there is Terry. Oh, yes, of course, Terry. All right, now I recognize Terry. Hello, Terry. How are you? Well, she hasn't got her audio on, so... Uh, I think like Josh was saying... You know, you, you have you have these things like race. So you, you already have you already have five, six, ten, whatever things you say are dividing. You know, with with with, with Republicans, with Democrats, and especially with the Trump stuff. But that the the COVID thing was one other thing that we didn't need at this time to divide us and like 
I think like Josh is sort of saying, you know, and Trump just took advantage of that. Well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's the question. It really divided us e even more with another thing that we didn't really need right now. Should something like a disease divide us? You know, uh, no. I mean, <laughs> but who invented that? Who invent, invented that divide? Trump. Trump. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I can't find disagreement with that. I mean, you know, that's what I'm saying. Maybe it would have happened. If it weren't way. for Trump, everybody in America would be lining doubts. up for a shot right now, except right. some of the anti-vaxxers. And, and what about the last Republican, oh. you know, presidents we've had? How would they have handled it? Uh, I, I, mean, I think I think Bush would have told everybody to get a shot. Yeah, talk, talk so about too. the seriousness of it. I uh, yeah, both Bushes. Yeah. Uh, and both Bushes <laughs> would. I, I certainly think Clinton would have. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Obama would have. You know. So I mean, I I I I, I think those people are. So like Josh says, you know, this president and, and with this kind of topic, or there's something that he could just. To exploit Ooh. onto his side yeah. is a bad timing. Yeah. Terry, how you doing out there in Idaho, isn't it? No, I'm in Wyoming. 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 Right? Okay. Oh. Yeah, right. But listening to Joss, uh, I am reading a book by David K. Johnson, I think it is, How Trump Has Scammed the American Taxpayers. It'll make your blood boil if you choose to read it. But there was another book, uh, it's called Strong Men, and it's the history, it's, uh, it was written by a historian, her name is Ruth something or other, but it is the history of fascists. And what Trump is doing and has done is right out of the... Well, it's right out of the fascist uh, handbook, there's no question about it. First yeah, of all, one of yeah. the main hallmarks of what a fascist does first is discredit the press. That's right. You know. Yeah. But then once he's but it's a, it's the abortion issue, uh, and there's another law that just went into effect in uh, Texas today mm -hmm. about fines for like telemedicine and sending someone medications for a you know a, a medical abortion instead of a physical one. I was just reading that this afternoon. Yeah. So yeah. What well, yeah. I wonder where where in the law the, the you you are right there is such a thing as medical abortion there are certain things you can take after the fact that will well they, I, they have you know yeah and i don't know I, I don't know how that fits in with te texas law you know um they well, just passed it went uh, yeah. into effect yeah i was reading it i don't know if it was washington post or yeah anything. i don't know i mean i don't know i don't know if that stuff can be done before that six week mark or after I don't know. I'm yeah. probably the worst person in the world. To ask. Well, he, <laughs> oh no! A telemedicine. If they were to mail, you know, these pills, um, they could either go to jail or get a ten thousand dollar fine. From what the article was saying. Yeah, I mean, it's a you know, uh, they've got a you know, a, a, a bounty on <laughs> people like that. I mean, I mean, I let's. I think we talked about it before, but I just wonder. You know what will happen when some of this comes times to be decided, and you know I think it was Alito who brought it up the very first time with the Mississippi law or whatever. I think we talked about this on a Saturday night, where I think everyone thinks that he's automatically going to be, you know, for this or whatever. But he was just so skeptical about saying, you know, if we let this go into effect, what is to stop other states? Who have law? Who can make laws on their books that folks like you will hate? For instance, extremely strict gun laws, and then put all the same kind of stuff in place where you can just, you know, call up and say, "Hey, my neighbor's got an illegal gun," and and you know, not only get them arrested and thrown in jail, but get a damned reward for it too, or whatever. Or, or yeah. they don't even have to call. I can call. You know, about Alex Bennett in New York. What's to stop that? And you know, they straight up, uh, the opposing counsel was like, oh, well, nothing. And, you know, and yeah. I think Alito was like, and, and you're not a little worried about that? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Texas, Texas purposely went around the Supreme Court, I think. Well, I think that, I think that all of them are trying to do that as a, as a strategy to provoke the court to finally make a decision because maybe 
We don't have anybody. It's 50-50. We don't know? have anybody. They'll either they get what they want or they won't. We don't have anybody on here from Texas tonight like Scott or Jack. But I, I'd like to know if this governor really believes and is really against abortion or he's just trying to make it rough for people. And, and oh, I, it's all I'll control and I think it's all part of this fascist bullshit. Yeah, exactly. exactly. I mean, it really is. Um, reading that book on strong men, um, I think I told you last time I was on, you know, I was down in uh, Argentina, um, you know, during uh, 1974 and after Alley Empty, uh, this Pinochet, yeah. apparently he would um, send up helicopters and he would kick people out of the helicopters. That was something that I learned um, about that time. We had dinner with one of the the ambassadors when I was down in Santiago. Mm-hmm. He says, oh, no problem. You just have to be in by 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or whatever it is. So mm-hmm. they gun you down if it's 10.01. <laughs> Oh, but I didn't know they were throwing people out of helicopters. Too. Pinochet, Pinochet yeah. was the worst, just the worst. Yeah. And what happened yeah. was the the problem was there was a guy in power in Chile named Allende, and mm-hmm. Allende yeah. was a communist, but he said he was a democratic communist, and he was going to have a democratic democracy. And the United States couldn't stand the idea that some kind of guy would come along and start a democratic uh, communist country because then he would show that, hey, it wasn't the communist part, which is a, an economical part that yeah. was dangerous. Uh, it was combined with anything like totalitarianism and so on. But if, if you if you created as a democracy, it might actually be a success, and we couldn't stand that idea, all right? Yep. So we had him killed. Yep. We had him killed yep. and put Pinochet, yep. we put Pinochet in power. And Pinochet turned out to be one of the most murderous leaders of any country in, in recent history. He might have even yes. eclipsed Hitler. And I think Trump would be exactly the same. If yeah. not worse. Yeah, well, he probably looks upon if Pinochet. If he comes back so. into office, I figure yeah. I'm dead. And I already told my hubby, <laughs> I'll have to go out and buy some fentanyl or something. Fentanyl. You know? Well, no, fentanyl, <laughs> fentanyl I, I is just a painkiller. I don't want to government. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. No. Yeah. You had yeah. your hand raised, and Jack? I really, really. Hey, you know, you, you speak his name and there he is. Jay uh, Barry there he is. Amongst you. Yeah. <laughs> You were asking about uh, the governor of Texas and uh, where he's at with this yeah, I mean, abortion. He, he, does he believe what he's doing? He believes in getting elected. And Texas has had a, a, a not uncommon thing happen where the major cities, Houston, San Antonio, Dallas, uh, are pretty purple are pretty purple but you get out in to the hitherlands like like i live only 25 miles from dallas and uh we can't get a democrat elected to a county-wide position in my county has not happened in years and we've got two liberal arts colleges in the county but uh, the gerrymandering that has gone on, uh, we were talking about this last night on my show. Uh, the city of Denton, Texas, the uh, county seat. Yeah. The district that I am in goes from this town with two liberal arts colleges to 150 miles to the west where the most liberal thing is, gee, they pasteurize the milk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you, and, uh, you know, I mean, um, uh, you're, what you're saying is he's a demagogue. Uh, I'll tell you this. Uh, our governor, as you probably know, is in a wheelchair. He was... Uh, 
in that wheelchair because of a uh, event that happened. And uh, when he got into elected office, one of the first things he did <clears throat> after he got $250,000 for the injuries that he received was to work diligently to pass a measure to put a cap on how much money, if you were injured, you could sue for. And he got it passed. This uh, most recent uh, abortion uh, legislation that was just talked about, and there hasn't been much discussion about this on a national level, <clears throat> uh, the governor of Texas signed into law a measure two weeks ago that makes it illegal for a doctor to prescribe the uh, morning after pill. Okay, uh, that's it, what that's what we were asking earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, they, you know, he's, you know, he he got it signed uh, in the Texas legislature, and uh, once again, it is to me a, more the uh, morning after pill is an aspirin. Thought, you know, I thought it was something funny. They should make one a day before. How about instead of the morning after the day before? <laughs> well, you know, well, <laughs> well, 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 you know, take the morning after. I'm all confused. <laughs> Well, Tony, back when I was a young man and all my parts worked, we had the best birth control ever. <laughs> An outraged father with a shotgun and the Playtex panty brief that girls used to wear that I swear to God, I, and, I might also I add to get off in the uh, back. And, of and the also the, <laughs> the thing that prevented us was a woman's dignity because uh, they, they would they would make you honest. You know, uh, you weren't going to. You know, uh, anyway, uh, it, it's just all, you know, I don't know. I don't, uh, I, I'm kind of like with Terry, you know, I, I don't know what kind of world we're living in now. It's not I the don't one, it's not the, it wasn't the one I signed up for. It's you know? very ugly. It's very ugly. It's very ugly. Well, and I blame Trump for the ugliness. No, you can't blame Trump. I yeah. do. You cannot. I it it started way before Trump. I was in a conversation yeah. last week Rick. about this, and uh, uh, someone suggested it may have started. And I can't think of the name of the Speaker of the House in the eighties that was uh, Newt Gingrich. This person oh, contends on the floor. Remember? Yeah. Didn't, this, yeah. This, this person. My said, pal. My pal Newt. You hated his guts out. <laughs> well, I you hated, had him on that day, remember? I hated his guts, but I was laying low for him. I was very nice to him the first time he was on the show. I remember that, yeah. And so he thought that I was a good guy, so he came back for a second, <laughs> and that time I nailed him. Nailed him. Yeah, that was even into you, I, I said to him, I said, are you, are you, are you uh, a religious? And he said, oh, oh yes. Yeah. I said, are you God-fearing man? He says, yeah. I said, then why do you do all those talk shows on Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like and that. he said, oh, well, uh, I go to church first. I said, that doesn't matter. The Lord says hey. it is a day of rest. And <laughs> apparently you're not going along with that precept. And uh, he, he was at a loss for words, absolute loss for words. But I wanted to nail him because I had been setting him up to come back, feel comfortable, <laughs> and then nail him. You know. Ah, you sneaky bastard! No, you. that's where you, the way you do it. You, you, you put these people in a comfort zone. You know, a lot of people when they do talk shows and they're hosting talk shows, uh, if, for instance, if Trump's on, all of a sudden they would go after him. Well, mm -hmm. you know, no, no, you can't it, do that. You no, gotta, you no, gotta lay for him. No, no, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta wait till the end of the interview to nail him, mm -hmm. because you want don't want him walking out in the middle of it. You know, oh, you want to get him like he's on the you, way out the door. It, maybe, maybe you seem like a bigger hero if you go after him from the very beginning, but if he sticks, he sticks around, and you finally nail him at the end. The that's, final impression. That's right. That's the place to get him. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I never wanted to be a hero with my audience. And sometimes they'd listen to me and go, "Where's he going with this interview?" They tell the guy he's full of shit. You know. And I go, that's the way they walk out. Because I learned early that you could get people to walk out very easily. Oh, really? You very do. easily, yeah. You didn't want that. Yeah. Well, you got to remember, they're playing to their audience, too. Sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. and if they walk out early, they're heroes. But you see, they, I, went, they, 
I wonder how many people on both sides actually believe the crap they're saying. No, oh, I wonder. I really do wonder about that. I think they know yeah. it's all bullshit, yeah. really. Yeah. Uh, uh, Terry, any thoughts on that? Oh, oh, I, you know, living here in Wyoming, I, I think they firmly believe it. Oh, really? Yes. Yes. You mean the people yes. who are running for office believe in what they're saying? Um. Give us a percentage. Where, where, where is that? Where is that low life Bobert from? Is she Wyoming? Colorado. No, Colorado. Colorado. Man, what a piece Western of work! Colorado. What a piece of work that woman is. You know, she's amazing. I noticed you <laughs> nodded your head, uh, Josh. Yeah, I mean, she's pretty stupid, like you said. That's not, you know, really what we need. I, I don't understand. I mean, uh, if you don't like uh, another congressman or another senator, member of your own party, not a member of your own party, so what? It's 535 people working well, there. Whatever happened? are not going to gonna like each other. There's 150 people that work in my plant. <laughs> All of us don't like each other. We've got a job to do. Do your job. I mean, what, what, what I don't get is, uh, you know, whatever happened to the days where, you know, people were adversaries, but they were friends at the same time. You know, we always used to hear about this Democrat getting along and being close friends with this Republican, and yet they had diametrically opposed politics. We did don't you have hear that the, uh, Did you hear the poem at uh, Dole's uh, funeral today? No. What did the staff say? had a poem. It was oh. pretty good. You ought to look it up. Yeah. About what? It's about the dash between the years. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he was one of those guys that got along with everybody. Exactly. You know? And it's I what you do with the dash between the year you were born and the year you died. Oh, don't say that. Oh, very good. Well, very good. Tell Tony, me, do you yeah, guys yeah, say that he was a lot softer guy? Oh. You know, he would, I think he would rather um, get in an agreement with somebody rather than arguing. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, he also. He, he was such a soft guy. He's also the first uh, the first uh, politician I know to come out uh, doing ads for erectile dysfunction. Yeah. Oh really? Oh yeah. He told me his left hand. Oh, yeah, well, for for uh, Viagra. Viagra. Yeah. He said, you know, he said, I hate to admit this, but sometimes you need a little help. <laughs> and I, I use Viagra. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hi everybody. Yeah, I, I hold this, Roger. What? what? Creator of Fox News. What was that? This has been a long clan. Oh. They said the Fox News. I thought I, 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 hold on a second. I thought I did. I thought I did something wrong here. I pushed a button or something, and it turns out it was Jack. Yes, yeah, sorry. Getting ready for my show, and I hit the wrong button. <laughs> one of my Alex, promos. Did, did you Fox hear the news? Hmm? They they lit the Fox Christmas tree on fire in Manhattan outside the studio. Some, some, in, uh, Oakland also. They yeah. hate Fox. Yes. Yeah. It was. It was. <laughs> I mean, that's real hatred. Burning a Christmas tree. Oh, my God. What did that yeah. Christmas tree ever do to you? I mean, come on. I mean, I know they don't like Fox News, but that's taking it to the extreme. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They're burning baby Jesus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, the extreme would be having Cuck Tucker oh, Carlson exactly. strapped to the tree. Yeah. Well. You, Alex, does he wear a toupee, you think? I always stare at him at the Tucker? TV. I, think I, I have no idea. I have no idea. Why would we care? It's just driving me crazy because it looks like a shower cap on his head. I, I never... <laughs>